Pocket six is on the bottom. Now this is not the best situation I'd wanted because if he is three betting light, sixes could be good here. However, there's not a good hand to go call call with. Okay, well, he checked the board where he should be betting, which again, kind of rings a little alarm. If he checks again, I'm kind of ranging him on nines and tens. So he bets 604. I think we can fold here. From a young age, I used to always play card games with my family. We used to gamble. I remember being like 10 or 11 and playing like a Spanish game which kind of translate to gin. My mother and my grandmothers, my cousins, they used to always get together, start drinking and just play cards for like the whole night. And that like intrigued me. Once I got out of high school, I was actually working at a real estate office. And I was putting a lot of hours a week and not making that much money. And I felt everybody in that real estate office was just like waking up to just go there and spending the whole day there. And then nighttime comes and like, they just have no life. Like, you put in your hours and you take care of your business and then, you know, you go home. I just never, I never wanted that. The reason poker is so popular and so great is that the, like, the best is not always going to win. Like, there's not going to be any other, like, if you play pool or if you play chess and, like, there's the best in pool or the best in chess, like, you're not going to beat them. Like, there's not going to be a day where you're just going to beat them. The beauty about poker is that, that you can be the best. Raise. The action now moves up the table to Howard Letterer. And he's going to raise it $12,000. As we move around, Darden folds. Next in line, Chris Moneymaker. Chris Moneymaker, interestingly, had never played in a live tournament before coming to the World Series. He paid $40 to participate in an online tournament, and he won his $10,000 seat into the World Series by winning that tournament online. And here he is in Las Vegas, staring down two of the biggest names in the game, Howard Lederer and Johnny Chan. Yeah, we just heard him say that he's not going to back down, and in fact, we're seeing him stare them down. He says he's learned a lot from both of these players over the years and he's using their techniques on them right now. You know, it's up to you, right? Yeah, but... I didn't even know I had a hand, I'm sorry. <laughs> or is he? I think he just forgot to play, Norm. You're staring at him, I'm thinking, what, are you looking into his soul or what? <laughs> My favorite era in poker was between 2006 and 2011. 03, 04, 05, you know, right after Moneymaker, I mean, it was a very vibrant time in the community. It's hard not to like. Online poker was thriving and booming. It was easy to print. It was also the poker boom. So poker as an industry was growing rapidly and expanding beyond what it had previously known. So it was more of like a free-for-all for problem solving back then. It was a much more primitive game. Solvers, of course, were years away from being a thing. Psychology was a much more important aspect. Gotcha. It was really like a battle of wits. To me, that was just like the most fun I ever had playing poker. A 10 and only a 10 will save Cunningham. And now the river card, it's a three! Yeah! Jamie Gold slays his biggest opponent. A lot of people in the heyday of poker in the beginning could get by being mediocre poker players because there were a ton of recreational players. Somebody who knows poker right now, if you explain to them what the games were like back then, they would just say, no way, you're exaggerating. It was really that ridiculous. The games were so unbelievably easy to beat. I was playing online poker and just making all my money online that I was making annually as a teacher in like a weekend. 
I thought that I would just win a million dollars in tournaments every year. And back then, there was a lot more hope of having this huge career. If you're sitting on the sidelines and you're seeing the money being won, maybe you've even had some success at some level, the idea that you could make a living and get into this world has to be pretty appealing. I was doing well for a long time before I considered myself a professional. I really just decided I was a professional because I wasn't doing anything else. It was never a conscious decision, I think. This is what I want to do as a career. I didn't go to high school, I didn't go to college, and I sort of realized, like, I guess I'm kind of a professional poker player. I guess it's sort of what I do. Full house, Chris Moneymaker eliminates Sam Farhaw and in a very swift and unlikely manner is atop the poker world. This is beyond fairy tale. It's inconceivable. Okay, right now it's 12 p.m. I normally go to Sands about, say, three to four days a week, depending on how the sessions are going. And uh, I didn't go yesterday, but I'm going today. I went to Sands Monday and Tuesday also which went all right, but uh, I'm a slightly up a little bit this week, not too much, uh, which is annoying because I've put in about, I think, 20 hours so far. At nighttime, it's a little quicker because there's less traffic, but uh, we should be all right at this time. So I predict we get there in about an hour. And then you play for like how long? Uh, I normally don't like to play more than six hours a session. So anywhere within six hours, sometimes I set a goal. And if I'm able to reach that goal within the time frame, I'll just get up and leave. And uh, I get some slack for that sometimes because I'm told that I should just sit there and just grind the whole session. However, I've done that many times and ended up like losing the profits that I'm up. And then I just spent the whole day at the casino with nothing to show for it. Oscar is someone I've known personally for a pretty long time now. We both come from New Jersey. We both lived in North Bergen, New Jersey. That's right across the river from New York City. And as far as poker was concerned, a couple of years back, maybe like five, six years ago uh, from today, it was a pretty like booming uh, scene. Like there was a lot of underground games running around town and we used to just circuit them. Neither of us were really that good as it pertains to just being overall good at poker. But I think that as it ranked in terms of like skill comparatively to the field, Oscar and I were a little bit ahead of the curve. And because of that, we ended up becoming friends. I used to play at a game in Jersey City where I used to deal and Christian was being put into the game. The guy would put him in for like a thousand and he would cash out like four or five grand every night. I was watching him raise a lot. I was watching him three bet a lot. And I was just like, wow, this kid's like, must be nice. You know, you're just catching the cards, right? And he would just like nod at me and say, yeah, you know, I'm catching the cards. But then like, I saw him like show down one hand that wasn't like a good hand, but he won the pot. It was like, I don't even remember the exact hand, but I know like, I was surprised that there was that much money in there and he had this hand. And that's when I knew that, you know, he was doing something different. And, that his studying and his working was paying off. And I had fell behind all those years that I wasn't studying. Whatever drove me at the time to want to be better than Oscar, I feel like there's somebody out there with that same commitment to want to be better than me. And I don't want them to catch me. And I don't think Oscar has that kind of like fire yet. He's seen me charge people to get help from me. And he has the ability to get it for no cost and he still chooses not to and what i've begun to understand is simply that i don't think he knows where to begin so me and my sister were really close uh my mother passed away when we were young and uh yeah between me and my father it was just tough raising a girl when you're two guys you know uh, and she's been through a lot of tough times in her life. I actually, I got into a car accident a couple years ago and I received some money from that. And I could have just taken the money and moved somewhere and just like try to pursue poker 100%, which I don't know, some people told me I should have done that. But uh, seeing my sister struggle and me being so close with her and uh, she had a, her first 
child passed away for SIDS uh, at nine months old. And uh, yeah, she's been struggling through her life a lot. So like when I got this settlement, I decided to just, I talked to my father and cause I didn't have any credit. I told him if he wanted to like join and get a house, uh, something that like could be within the family. And I mean, my sister works and everything and like she, she supports my nephew herself, but it's good to like, you know, be able to like give them stuff that like I didn't have growing up. Like I didn't have much growing up. Down versus your under the gun limb range. Um, well, let's talk about a few things. So, if you three bet with ace and off, what size would you use? Well, if he made it two, I'm leaning towards like 8k, so maybe 7,500 to 8k. Yeah, I think that's really good. Um, I think you should also three bet like the ace wheel suited yeah like i mean well those are the only suited hands i would three bet i mean ace 10 off will be my worst non-suited hand but then i mean i would occasionally three bet he's won previously a lot at the stakes that he currently plays but the stakes he currently plays don't necessarily provide him enough to both live and continue to move through the ranks i try to play it as safe as i can probably not play my best poker because uh, I need to win. So like I'll sacrifice getting better and expanding on other theories of the game just to book a win. This flat should be heavy. No, I mean, that's just whatever, man. He just punted off of these five in the spot. I don't know what it is, but I know, but let's say he's like a regular player. Like this flat should be cut. He doesn't feel like the strategy that higher stakes players apply, apply to him. However, the issue that we'll find is that he can't move up because the strategy that he applies doesn't succeed in the bigger games, which he needs to get to to be successful. So it's kind of like a conundrum. If you're taking very low risk, your reward is very low. So we need to like find spots to increase risk calculated so that we can gain reward so that we can kind of like move away from where we're at. And that kind of goes in terms and of- And my thing is like, it's hard to take that risk when you don't have something to risk. Right, but you have opportunity and that's more important than money. Yeah, but opportunity is not gonna pay my bills. Opportunity is not gonna put gas in my car. Opportunity is not gonna cover my student loans. I put, like I understand and I'm super grateful for the opportunities, but the opportunities don't don't cover my expenses. Like, no, but they do, I, they will if, if, if you succeed in the opportunities you're given. But if I fail, then you're just where you're at now. I don't want him to play 1-2 for the rest of his life. I don't want him to play 2-5 for the rest of his life. I think his ceiling is somewhere between like 5-10 and 10-20. And that's really good. Like if you can play 5-10, 10-20 for a living, you're making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Like, like obviously you should take lower risk because you're at almost risk of ruin. And I agree with you, right? but, like, but that's the only way that I know how to I know, continue being able to live my life. I know, that's like, what I'm saying. But you don't want to live this life I don't want to live this life, but it's right. a life that I've like kind of forced myself into. Running the necessary plays to become a winning player at that level will mostly take a lot of like inner dialogue in terms of like, are you willing to risk this much? Are you willing to look like an idiot? Are you willing to be fearless in situations where like you maybe have more money at risk than you're comfortable losing? Down through the ages, man's quest for easy wealth has often led to gambling. There have always been those who chose to worship at the altar of that fickle goddess chant. Men who lived and sometimes died in the pursuit of excitement and riches gained without labor, risking all upon the turn of a wheel, rising to the peaks of affluence, then sinking to the depths of poverty and despair, slaves to the varying moods of that heartless lady, luck. In general, humans are uncomfortable with ambiguity and uncomfortable with uncertainty. We like things to be stable, we like things to be black and white, we like to label things, we like to have an answer. 
A leads to B. Not well, A could also lead to C, and it can also lead to kind of C and a half-ish, and actually the alphabet's not really relevant here, which is the way that life is. Life is noisy, life is uncertain, life is risky. There's nothing that's ever 100% true. Now, because that's kind of the human tendency, that can actually be very detrimental in a lot of decision-making environments. And poker is an environment where you really have to understand risk if you're going to play well. And a lot of people can't get past that hump. I can imagine that Berkey's going to put another 17,000 in there with this holding. Have you ever watched Berkey play? I have, I have, but is, he lives for these moments. I came to poker late in life. I started literally from zero. I did not know how many cards were in a deck. So believe me, I did not know if a flush beat a straight or a straight beat a flush or what a full house was. This was just a totally foreign language. So for me, I was more interested in a lot of the concepts around poker, and I had no idea really that poker was even a tool for this until I started researching for my next book, The Role of Luck in Our Lives, and trying to figure out how do I get into this question of how much of our lives do we control? And I came across John von Neumann's Theory of Games, which is the foundational text of game theory. I'm glad that you're asking this question because it's really a very good one. No, we don't have enough people and we better do something about it. And I hesitate to say that we better do something about it quickly, but rather we better do something about it both quickly and then continuously. So John von Neumann, this absolutely brilliant guy, one of the greatest polymaths of the 20th century, father of the computer, one of the fathers of the hydrogen bomb, inventor of game theory. He was a huge poker player, and he thought, if I solve poker, I'm going to have the key to the most complex decision-making in the world. Because poker, unlike chess, is much more like life. Because real life is a game of incomplete information. So there's information that we have in common. Then there's information that only I know. There's information that only you know. And we're not quite sure how much of what I know you know, how much of what you know I know, and that's poker. That's not chess, that's not even Go, even though Go is much more strategically complex than chess, it's still a game of complete information where there's always a right move. And in poker, there's no right move because there's no always. We can only make certain assumptions. He's got that look, man. I've seen this Berkey look before. Is it the poker twinkle? Yeah, he is. I wouldn't be surprised if we see a five bet to the 10 of 60,000. So taking risks as a poker player, taking risks in life, does not mean that you're going to become an aggressive maniac. The rational, the smart choice, is actually to take risks when the percentages are on your side. What did, uh -oh. I, what did I tell you, Ollie? Uh-oh. And to not take them when they're against you. 53,000. <laughs> 53K. As Berkey zeroing in on Haxton. Don't adjust your screens. This man just stuck $53,000 into the pot with King-5 suited and downs Haxton. Now we're playing some poker. All right, so you ready to do this thing? Don't. Your give, new student. Don't give me that bullshitty. What? Fucking whatever you're doing right now. You're trying to get things hyped. Yeah, don't. What do you mean, though? This is going to be your new student for the next month. This is like this, the, the next version of, of, of me, but with less uh, knowledge and hunger and spice. Call your friend. Your student. This is... This is not a touch screen? This is a computer. What the fuck's going on? Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, welcome to uh, The Call. We're going to call this segment The Call. The Call? Just that. Nothing all right. else. The Call. Sounds good. Um, all right, so you've been, how you been winning? Uh, I had a profitable week last week. This week, I uh, just broke even. The week sure. prior to that, I had a break-even week also. So you nervous? A little bit. A little nervous. You should be. I should be, right? <laughs> I'm nervous <laughs> and I'm excited at the same time, so I'm very eager to get out there. 
Um, what's what's your expectation regarding the academy, and then uh, what are you kind of anticipating as far as like what we'll be doing as follow up stuff? Uh, as far as the academy, my expectations are just I'm gonna go there with an open mind. I'm gonna just try to take everything in as much as I can and try to apply it to the player pool that I play at. But uh, like it's difficult for me to really put like time in studying because I play one two for a living and I feel like I've figured out a way to beat one two and I know the stuff that you guys teach is like it, it's, it's really good stuff but I just don't think it applies for what I'm doing right now. But isn't that just kind of like acknowledging that you're not maximizing your current situation? Right? Because like if you were winning the most that you could win at one two, you would be you should you shouldn't be in such a desolate spot. I'm not saying that I'm winning the most that I can win at one two. I'm saying that I I have like a strict uh You have like a good survival strategy. Correct. And that's I know that's not the best strategy or the correct strategy, but unfortunately because of my circumstances, it's what I have to do at the moment to get by. And I don't like it. So I think the big struggle for me is that I really empathize with people who want something desperately and can't seem to obtain it. I can relate to that. I know what it's like to pursue something and fail. It happened with me in baseball. And like that was heartbreaking whenever I had to come to the realization I wasn't good enough. Rick, that was a good pitch. That was a good pitch. You just got to bring it down. The second struggle I have is feeling like I can somehow help. It's hard to try to lay out a roadmap to somebody who is resistant to the idea of actually following that path and, and expecting results. Right, so like we keep kind of coming back to the same thing where your circumstances are, are having massive, massive impact on your decision-making ability. And you know, I've been broke. I know the struggle that you're going through, man. It's like, I grew up the same way. I fucking spent a lot of time in my career dead ass broke. And the way that I see this, like, I think the Academy is going to help. I, I definitely think that like, you have a lot to learn about being a professional poker player and, and strategy construction and stuff like that. But I also think it's like cart in front of the horse kind of stuff. You've been very close to your emotional breaking point a lot. You got to get to that breaking point and power through it. Right now you're kind of like on a path to just stay as is. And the problem with that is that the environment continually changes. So it'll be harder and harder and harder to basically stay as is. you're the nail. Today I'm the nail. Uh, I lost one buy-in. It was a pretty uneventful day. Uh, I would accumulate chips and then lose it whenever I had a value hand. I think that there's something very romantic about the pursuit of the day-to-day -day grind in poker and I think it's what keeps Oscar in the trap. I flopped a set and lost to an overpair, a run to run a diamond. I flopped a flush and lost to a straight flush on the turn. And just, yeah, I mean, every time I build my stack, I would lose a big chunk of it with a value hand. So I kind of just wish I didn't get any good hands because I would have just been bluffing small pots and just staying away from the big pots. He still is enamored by the idea that he can play when he wants. He's not working a nine to five He's sitting down in a nine-person arena and competing. But the irony is that in order to capture that freedom, you have to develop a skill set. Otherwise, you are victimized to precisely a nine-to-five approach towards the game where you're just pumping in hours and waiting and waiting and waiting. I prefer the drive back over the drive there. Driving back, it's like, yeah, I'm more tired than I was before, but the day's over and I get to go home and relax. When I start driving here in the morning, it's like I know that I got the whole day ahead of me and I'm gonna have to go play poker for several hours. It's like difficult for me to like see what Christian sees or see where like he wants me to go. Cause I've been stuck doing this repetitive grinding 
for so long that it's kind of become natural to me. Um, step one, you'll be on an air mattress for at least a week. That's We're fine, man. Still in space. <laughs> air mattress is fine with me. As long as I have somewhere to lay down, I'm cool. Yeah, yeah you'll be straight. Uh, All right, bro. We'll chat later. All right, man. You guys take care. All right, bro. See you soon. All, All right. right. Have a safe one. Yeah. So that that one okay, I guess. Well, they're right. You know, like my mental state of the game, the way that I approach it. But like, I always come with an excuse, and it's always like based on my situation around me. And I need to stop doing that. And that's why, like, I'm gonna go to Vegas for three weeks. I'm gonna just leave everything here. And even if I fail, that's fine. You know, because like that's part of poker. Sometimes you fail. And like he said, he's been broke many times before. You know, you just gotta be able to pick yourself up and just keep pushing through. And I think that's what he was trying to tell me, you know, like stop making excuses like in a way and just like always like try to push through the adversity. I'm just scared to like not book the win, but I need to stop thinking like that. And I'm gonna start doing that as soon as, you know, I get to Vegas, I'm gonna change. That's a promise. So we just got back, the day started Around 12 o'clock, I left my house and I'm heading back now. Played about eight hours today. Sorry I couldn't bring you guys a win, but it's okay because tomorrow's another day. Here's one for the history books. An unknown youngster has made it all the way to a heads up match with the defending champion. The Railbirds love this matchup. You can feel the tension building and building. Here we go. The biggest pot in World Series history is riding on Fifth Street. And a four clubs and Seidel has done it. What a pot. Johnny Chan can't quite believe it. It's a hand young Eric Seidel will long remember. Eric Seidel is someone who is a phenomenal player and who has been successful for longer than anyone else. I mean, he's been winning since the 80s and still remains competitive in the high roller scene today. So he's someone who's really adjusted as the game has evolved. Eric Seidel is a newcomer, but we expect to see him over and over again at the final tables. I feel like I'm struggling to understand the game every time I sit down and looking for what, you know, what the hell's going on? How is, you know, what, what are people doing? What is this person doing? And it's not a job where you can just show up and play the way you've been playing uh, and assume that things will go well. Got there. Obviously, we know all flushes got there. What exactly are we trying to extract value from? People don't recognize how much work and how much open mindedness you need to develop as a poker player. A lot of his observation and trying to figure out what the best players are doing and how the game is changing. To me, it seems very difficult to have an overly large ego and play poker because it's such a humbling game. Every every time you sit down, you you know you are up against amazing players and really brilliant people. It's not fun or comfortable to flop a boat and walk away from the investment Shulman has made in this pot, but he is veteran enough to understand that that just might be the right thing to do here. I'm arrogant about my game when I play at times, like, don't get me wrong, but when it comes to the broader analysis, like, I like to just think about what's going on and kind of what the cards are doing at times. Like, these are very smart people making decisions, you know? This is not the era where, like, you just watch and assume you know the answers, you know? So, I mean, that, that part is genuine. I don't feel that. A lot of people feel that, that they see what's going on. Like, I, I often identify mistakes or non-mistakes that I think, but, you know, it's not that clear. This is a very difficult spot for a player of Scott Seaver's ability, and, and it's a big-time TV game. Sure. Scott, Scott, Scott. That's all you could have, right? Kings. Just kings. Even when it comes to something as basic as, like, session review, I'll think about a hand, right? And the best I can usually even come up with is like having something resembling an idea of like 
how I feel about it. Maybe like a one to five scale, right? With a one being like, that was fucking atrocious, to a five being like, that was almost certainly good. It's hard to have perspective on it. If you're on a good streak, people tend to think that it's because they're playing great. And every year, the person who wins the main event and gets through 7,000, 8,000 people thinks they played better than anyone else played. They don't really recognize the run of luck they had. I think just my inexperience showed up because he's, he is the best player in the world and he just, uh, he outplayed me. Eric Seidel, no disgrace, he loses to Johnny Chan, but a terrific tournament. Anybody who finishes the day and thinks, oh, I played perfect today, is probably not playing that well. I think that happens a lot, is that people, uh, people are somewhat delusional and, uh, <laughs> and can convince themselves that they're much better than they are. That's very common in the game. So much of that delusion comes from the insanely large role that variance has over poker. And so to be able to differentiate if, when, where, and to what extent variance, uh, the role variance has had on that person's results is, is just an insurmountable task. Luck and variance obviously exist, but really what they are are in many ways, I think misunderstood, and maybe I misunderstand them, but I don't limit my understanding of luck and variance to purely statistical components. Like, I think if you're prepared, you're going to be luckier in a sense. Like, I feel like you have some control over those things. On, one time, let me get lucky. Let me hold up the best hand one time. A three to one favorite as we go to the flop. I think the role of variance in poker is complex and also paramount. I think uh, in the short term, it, it can just be the biggest deal in the world, which I think is what makes poker such a beautiful game, but also a huge pain in the ass all at the same time. Seven of hearts. Blank, deuce. And deuce. now on the river, deuce. only a queen deuce. would knock Matisal out of the main event. It is a queen. No! No! Hey! Ah! Fedor Holtz gets there on the river and scores the double knockout. Matt Affleck is going to have 41 million chips or no chips. He needs to dodge a king, jack, or eight. The river card. Oh, is an eight! A crushing blow to Matt Affleck. Bye-bye. <laughs> uh, Copian thinks he's going to hit the four-outer. Don't do it to me like that. That would be ugly. Uh, Copian needs a seven for a straight to knock out Jean Herbert. River card. Oh! Wong with pocket queens. Casella with kings. Boy with the ace queen. All right, here's the flop. It is seven. Queen trade. Duong oh set. Grabs control. Casella in trouble. Are you kidding me? And an eight only is gone. The river it is an eight. Oh, wow. Two outer. Wow. Let's go. Let's go. If you could simulate the best players just making a bunch of poker decisions, the cream rises 100% game of skill, unquestionably, but. It's a weird community. You can make money in it by not being the best player. I think you got lucky on me. I got lucky? Yeah, I think so. Wow. I have a number of poker player peers, friends, etc., who are also like variance apologists. And they blame way more than they ever should as a result of variance. I got lucky in a sense. That's right. Lucky in a sense? That's the nature of no limit. You can play it right and have it end so wrong. The turn card and Bach wastes little time in hitting his straight. Vanessa is crushed. This is 
Turn card, a spin, and Stern scores the flush. Come down. Oh, the King comes home for Timothy Sue. Oh, what alert, what alert. Bye-bye, Dennis. Oh, my God. There it is. Your boy hits a spade, it's a double knockout. Oh, it can't be. Another spade, wow. and boys flush nice. knocks out both Duong and Frank Casella. Well, the worst hand won, and the better players are going home. Ah, this is good. New money, please. Too hot. Is this gamble time? There's many forms of success, but if you're really serious about playing poker, your pursuits should probably be how to play the hands and, and just keeping your head screwed on straight, not waiting for the anvil of money to kind of fall out of the sky. If you can sustain that life, at a point, maybe it'll come together because you get what you put into things in general, I think. All right, welcome to the Academy. Um, first, uh, before we really get into any sort of strategy, I just kind of want to iron out what it is that we are offering. And really the two themes that we're trying to drive home are what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses, right? Um, because I think that in order to have any sort of level of self-trust or ability to, uh, you know, kind of internalize your decision-making process and then be comfortable with whatever the result is, you need two things. You need knowledge and you need self-awareness to the point where you're confident in your decision-making process, right? We must have had over 100 people say that their biggest strength is their ability to adjust. Everything that you're basing this off of is the fact that your assumptions are more accurate than your opponents. And sure, that's poker in a nutshell, right? Even game theory. The Academy's kind of evolved over the three and a half, four years that it's been in existence. Initially, it was a means to an end for live poker players to think more strategically. But I think it's actually grown more so into uh, kind of a three-day immersion experience of how to think about strategies as a whole. We're not gonna teach you like some one, two, three mechanic that's immediately gonna increase your bottom line. We're gonna teach you how to think about the spots that you're consistently put in over and over again and how to use deductive reasoning to arrive at better results. The Academy's tough, man. You're like, you're pretty much being shown everything that everyone does wrong every single day and realize that you're just like them. The first day you resist a lot because you think we're just a bunch of lunatics. But then it gets broken down into terms that you kind of understand. And then by the end of day three, you kind of are like, okay, I get it now. Like, this wins. We divide the morning between two theory lectures. We speak for about an hour and a half, take a short break, and then speak for another 90 minutes. Then we take lunch and go into three hours of gameplay where Christian and myself are watching and doing commentary over the video, which they have to study indefinitely moving forward. It's a lot. It's a lot of theory. It's a lot of in-game practice. And then, like, you know, through the gameplay, you kind of see your own mistakes and just realize, like, hey, like, maybe I'm really not that good. The RFID tables are kind of novel in a sense where I practically see them as a great learning tool. They get to hear the coach's feedback. They get to see every single hand revealed and kind of make reasonable assumptions based on having more information than if they were playing in a normal game. So it's a chance to see themselves on camera, see how they act. You see the nervous tics, you see the heavy breathing and the more amateurish stuff that comes with being inexperienced in these spots. It forces you to look in the mirror and like be really brutally honest with yourself because you have really strong personalities. Like, like Berkey doesn't go easy on anybody. Like he's there to tell you like you suck and it's fine. Like it's okay. It's far more of the entry point into mentorship, where it's like, okay, you've experienced these three days, and now you know how to think a little bit better about these problems. Now let the community and us as coaches kind of guide you forward in your studies. It's hard. If you start to think of this as a business perspective, you're all startups. And some of you have been startups for a decade, and that's tough. Most businesses fail by that point, right? The problem with that is, it's never as simple as, I'm gonna sit down, play the cards dealt to me, and Whatever happens, happens. The turn is the turn, the river is the river. There's nothing I can do that's out of my control. Sure, that is out of your control, but how you react to every single nuanced decision is 100% in your control. And each one of those mistakes is gonna compound. If we can help you guys understand 
why these problems exist, why they make you uncomfortable, why your opponents are failing, why you're failing, you'll be able to not only become more calibrated in your own environment, but you'll also be able to extrapolate that out and begin to independently solve these problems as they present themselves moving forward. Uh, let's take a brief break, give you guys a chance. I hope Oscar walks away from his experience here at the Academy with a more objective lens, I guess. And that happens a lot. We'll start the mornings with them recounting hands from the day before, and they'll go through the details of the hand, and they're just blatantly wrong. It's like, well, I watched the footage, and that's not actually what happened. So it, it removes that layer of being able to lie to yourself to kind of pacify the, the insecurities that come with like not being excellent at this game. And we are back for Soul for Y Academy Gameplay Edition number 12. We're, uh, we're off to the races here early on in uh, Software Academy. So here we see a raise and a three bet by Chris uh, targeting Oscar early with ace five offsuit. Oscar peels with king queen off and Chris is going to take the early lead here. These are going to be Oscar's biggest trouble spots. Uh, Everybody who's watching this video is going to get a chance to see to be determined and Oscar is the feature, right? Mm -hmm. so Both, this is where he's going to struggle the most. He's right. never, he never does this. Like, so I know Oscar very well, and it, I, I don't know the last time Oscar called a three by out of position with King Queen off and floated on 954. Sure. Never. Something that might be environmental. It just doesn't win at 1 2. Or at right, least in his mind. The anyway, issue right? is, I, if I said, how are you going to win this hand? Right. And I don't think he has a path for that. Right. And so that was, that was the greater point that I was trying to make in the sense that it leans upon both his biggest areas of weakness lack of construction and also like the, like the taxing emotion that come with continually getting beaten down in these spots, mm -hmm. right? So because he's just like kind of reacting in the moment with right. the line work, it's gonna lead him to uh, a net negative result. Yeah. And that net negative result is gonna further reestablish in his mind that like this is not good. And then it, once he sees Chris's hand, it's gonna default to, well that was just like really bad and I got unlucky to not win that pot. But you know, that couldn't be any further from the truth. He can't win that pot unless he flops the best hand by a long shot. Oscar is opening pretty light here with Chris taking all spots. I wouldn't have do this. This is targeting in a nutshell mm -hmm. here, right? 100% like, targeting. He knows he's being targeted. The table knows he's being targeted. He's made a comment about him being targeted. And Chris is just saying, no, 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 no. It's just my hands, I swear. But what he should do is actually just fold. Oh, this is crazy. Why? Why? <laughs> Why would you ever bet that card? This is fear. This is a fear He doesn't based... want to face a bet. Right, he doesn't want to face 500. And like, he should understand that he should be pumped for David to bet 500. I mean, that's, that's when you know the spot is shit. When you have the best hand and it takes an over bet for it to work. Yeah, that's tough, man. He's just, like, I don't think he's ever faced this kind of resistance on his luck, which is, like, it's new. You know, you're going to take some lumps and learn. Yeah, leading into a volatile opponent with no hand is nothing but trouble. Man, I love Oscar, but this is the worst I've seen him play in a long time. You're being particularly hard on Oscar. I know, but he's my friend. <laughs> well, he is. Like, at the same time, I, I have to be a little bit... I, I do agree. Like, there should be a big takeaway as to how unforgiving this game is. The difficult thing that I anticipate for us is explaining why this isn't unlucky. It's not unlucky at all. No, not even remotely He's going to call too. He's going to snap for sure. And the thing is, if he doesn't call, that's bad too. Yeah, Chris really kind of exposed him. Yeah. Right? You know? Yeah, yeah, And that's fine. Like, you've exposed me a lot of times and it makes me better. I'm way less interested in how Oscar adjusts moving forward. I'm far more interested in hearing his subjective analysis of what occurred today. Correct. I want to hear how often it was luck. I want to hear how often he felt like there was no need to adjust, that he had him right where he wanted him. I want to have him talk me through a bit of what this session was about to him. Because to us, I think it's really, really abundantly clear where his weaknesses lie. And I think that they've been suppressed by just years of being able to overcome them in soft environments. This hearing is... Uh on the subject of the regulation of internet gambling, from a lot of my conservative colleagues, I hear the mantra, never regulate the internet. And I guess what they really mean is never regulate the internet unless we find something offensive, and then we'll regulate it.
because this is the most substantive interference with the freedom of the Internet that has ever been enacted into law. People Over the past 10 years, the game's changed significantly. ...contemplated by the legislation is premised upon the ability of Internet gambling sites to detect and block attempts to gamble online by minors, compulsive gamblers, and individuals located in jurisdictions that legally prohibit gambling. Let me say in... You're not allowed to play in the U.S. unless you're in a handful of states, meaning a lot of the recreational players have been shut out from playing online, meaning there's less money in the pool. When that's the case, the game just gets significantly harder because the pros suck up the money faster. After Black Friday, I immediately decided I would move somewhere. I mean, online poker was 98% of my job. Uh, at that point, I played live during the summer and that was about it. I was humbled, you know, after a couple years living in Vegas. So, you know, the first couple years were fine. We were all growing, we were all learning, we were all winning. I think we were all generally seeing that we were just as good as everyone else out there. A couple of our friends were ranked as the best in the world, you know. But then we started to realize that the game was changing. There was this illusion of being good at poker because you're beating these weak players. But as like the better players became further and further apart from the pool, a lot of the community got left behind. I mean, in terms of what changes, it's just natural. It's just the evolution of the game. The bad players are gonna lose their money and stop playing. And you know, the good players are gonna gradually get better and the games are gonna get harder. Like it just took a lot longer for that to happen over those years because there were so many players. Probably 10 years ago, the naturally gifted player would almost always outperform the much less gifted player who studied hard. That's no longer the case. You can get very, very good now by studying, and you can get in trouble uh, if you're a very naturally gifted player who's kind of skated by on that uh, without hard work. I definitely knew that I could not continue to play as casually as I was. The game had just gotten too tough, and it just got harder, and, and, and it was very clear you know, from a decade ago that it just wasn't going to be an option anymore. I have a lot of love for the old days when it, when you knew everybody in the poker room. If there was somebody that you didn't know, they were not a good player. Now, if there's somebody that you don't know, it's some genius from Scandinavia or something and you know, <laughs> who's been sitting in front of a computer for the last eight years. Especially after Black Friday, the ratio of uh, pros to recreational players, um, you know, has continued to get worse. And the method of studying has changed a lot. With the evolution of technology and AI as it pertains to poker, people have been more able to understand how to optimally proceed in a variety of situations. And that problem solving was previously just done through human trial and error. 16, 32. So none of that matters. You either got it, or you either got it, or you don't. There were people that were treating poker more like a math problem, trying to figure it out, and I had never thought of poker as a math problem. I had always thought that I understood it. I understood math, and I probably understood it better than most of the people I was playing with. But I never tried to, you know, get to that point where I knew all the answers. I just wanted to know more than the rest. I wasn't playing uh, high enough stakes, really, ever, where I thought I needed to study, basically. If I was more concerned at that time with like moving up, it would have been a different situation. But basically, if you fall into a pattern where you're comfortable with the stakes you're at and you're making good money, a lot of times you don't have incentive to study. And I think I was, I was like that for several years. Becoming more self-aware, honestly, is the biggest jump that people have to take in order to become elite in this game. Um, just acknowledging your own mistakes and starting to realize that they're your mistakes and they're not anyone else's. And you making excuses for them doesn't mean they're gonna go away. So I heard there was a huge argument last night. Well, he got mad and he laid in bed on the air mattress and didn't want to talk to me. Oh, I just was like, <laughs> did it, I wasn't in a mood to talk. I finished watching the replay of our session that we had downstairs. And I knew that I didn't play well. I just didn't think that Christian was in it bash me as much as he did. Yeah. So I guess I was a little irritated about that. Yeah, he's just like not around our group a lot. We're like, 
If you perform bad, you're going to hear it. Do so you think like, that's the best way to improve somebody? I mean, I tried every other way with him, so. I felt like other players were not playing their best game also, and maybe he wasn't, like, so critical, which kind of makes sense because, like, we are friends and, like, he's trying to, trying to improve my game. Yeah. Um, also, you know, purposely was put in a bad seat, which I kind of asked for because I said that I would be able to adjust. And Why kind of, I was watching people like kind of punt their stacks away, and I was like, "Well, I like never punt." I'd so like to punt my stack it. away too. So I was like, <laughs> "Fuck it, let me just punt." You know, like I, I don't punt ever. Like I have an ace. Like he might be, maybe he has like king queen suited or something. Like I don't know. Like I don't expect to come last every day, and and like I'm not trying to make excuses, but I felt like, you know, I did get set over set, so like I'm not too mad about that. I mean, I did get lucky ace king versus aces, but even that hand, I played bad. Yeah, if you wouldn't have gotten set over set, you still would have come in last. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, and then yeah, even the ace, funny. no, I'm it's just the saying. truth, it's, it's, it's the truth. Like me and Christian obviously talk a lot of poker and like, I listen to it, but I really don't apply it too much. I just go to the game and I just kind of like, play tight, don't make mistakes and just try to profit and then leave. And you do win like that. Yeah. It's just and the and ceiling I do win is like really that. low. Correct. People playing 1-2 one, and 2-5, they're making mistake after mistake after mistake. So instead of just sitting out and not playing many hands, you should be trying to play every hand and capitalize on mistakes. their mistakes. Yeah. And that's what I feel like I wasn't doing. We understand the basic needs of everybody in the game. They want to win. They want to drag pots. Uh, and they're incentivized to do so by playing hands that they feel are profitable. So what we want to do is give them rope to continue with what makes them comfortable. We want to make them slightly uncomfortable, right? But we want them to trust the stories that we're telling them. So many of today's generation wants this game to just become sheer and utter strategy where all the gamble and tarnish is removed and we create an environment that's like super hostile and competitive. However, if you look at the landscape of poker right now, it's what the community is feeding off of. Why does every game need a fish? because the fish ignores default edges. The fish is losing in all these spots. The fish plays too many hands, the fish doesn't give a shit about position. And the fish sacrifices initiative over and over and over again because he doesn't understand the value of it. So the regs, the people who are feeding off this frenzy, only care about their default edges. They're not skillful, they're not doing anything to derive skill. All they're doing is trying to sit in an environment that's soft enough where playing in position with a good card distribution will print money. That's why poker's dying. It's not because it's any closer to being solved. It's because nobody's out there going to war. Nobody wants to play chicken with another reg. They're all just sitting there trying to avoid one another and pick up on whatever loose change there is. We're in there to cause problems. We wanna create chaos. So we wanna go after these passive types and everybody in your games are passive. They're all gonna react emotionally different to the chaos that you present. Some will ball up and flee. Others will combat you with other aggression and raw. Most of them aren't looking for that. Most of them aren't fighters. Most of them are gonna be the type that flee and you're gonna basically condition him to now stop playing a lot of hands and stop gambling at the table and eventually seat change or table change. And that's the last thing you want. So there needs to be a give and take. You don't wanna just skin him alive. You wanna make him think he has a fighting chance. You wanna have an environment where it's loose and gambly and you want to encourage other people to attack him so that he feels like it's not him versus you, but it's the two of you versus the world, in spite of the fact that they're losing. And more importantly, you want to protect them to the point where they're not losing as much to the environment as a whole because you're doing your damnedest to insert yourself against all the other players and reap those rewards yourself. Let's um, continue through the round table as we wrap. We had uh, Oscar. There he is. That's our man to be determined. Oh, um, was, he was pretty upset there. Uh, he's not happy. Um, Oscar needs to spend a lot of time correcting some of these mechanics that are just so founded in reactions. Um, I think that he's here because he wants to work really hard, and that's critical. But I think the toughest challenge we as coaches are going to have with him is him checking his 
former knowledge at the door. What do you think of uh, this experience for all of these players, and I guess particularly Oscar? Um, what now? Like, what moving forward? He's got a lot of work on his plate, man. I mean, this game's tough. This game is... It's humbling, like I said, uh, the cards just, they're not going to forgive any negative EV plays. So I think like he has to strip himself down to the core and kind of ask himself what he wants to obtain out of this game and how he plans to pursue it. And we can be his greatest asset or we can be, you know, his biggest points of resistance. It's kind of up to him. Is there a strategy that you can implement off of two and a half buy-ins at one, two? Probably. But is that strategy going to be lucrative enough in order to provide a life for you that's self-sustaining? Probably not. And I don't even think you're afraid of that. I think you're more afraid of some sort of change for better or for worse. And as long as you still possess like some sort of hope that your life is gonna change on the turn of a card, you're removing any sort of responsibility to yourself to actually take action. And that's really problematic because now it doesn't matter how much Chin and I teach you, and it doesn't matter how good you get at the game, you can't implement. It's simply not possible, right? And that's why it feels like it's a money issue. It has just enough glimmer of hope to it where you think that the cycle won't persist, but how long has this been going on? Since I got out of high school. I mean, for the most part. You've never had like uh, a fair amount of money from, from poker or anything? No. The only money that I ever had was like, I got into an accident and I was able to get a large sum of money and like I wanted to do something for my sister and for my father. Sure. So I invested in a house. Okay. You know, to move them in. That's so, noble. And I'm, I do believe that I can win at one two right just... until you're able to get out of the mindset of living win by win check by check 400 by 400 it, it can't happen like you know you can't tell me how many hours you even played last year you can't tell me where you're leaking where you're earning and these aren't just buzzwords that we throw around as professionals they're they're things that maybe 10 years ago weren't so necessary to survive in this game but they're imperative now. It's one of the most competitive markets that you're gonna come into. And you were lucky enough to get a leg up while it was super soft. So yeah, the game's passed you by since, but you have a lot of resources allocated to you. However, you keep yourself coddled inside of this like very protected environment where you're kind of like too big to fail. You have the right friends, you have the right network to ensure that you're always gonna have just enough to stay in action and break even. And that's literally all you're doing. Like, maybe you're a small losing player, maybe you're a small winning player. At the end of the day, though, it all equates to effectively a break-even career. And or losing. Yeah, and it's like, it's only going to get harder day after day, month after month, year after year, to pivot. Because, like, this probably feels like rock bottom, but it's not. You still have hope. And the more of these things that we can branch off into, the more likely it is you're going to find a very stable stream of income. And I think that that's like the one thing that you're lacking, right? It's not somebody gifting you a pile of cash. It's you actually deriving enough self-worth and self-trust to be able to make enough money to sustain and then grow from there, right? As opposed to just doubting every single decision. Like I got cold four bet in a one, two game and I had Queens and it was for 60 big blinds. Who cares, right? Like who gives a shit? It's just another thing to emphasize how unlucky we are. Like, if that's how far it's come, then there, there is no bringing you back, right? Like, let's find better ways to make an hourly because this is going to drive you absolutely mad. It's just like, I guess, like, I don't know what I'm good at, to be honest. Like, you say, like, like I know that I'm a good brother to my sister. I know sure. that I'm a good uncle to my nephew. I know that I care about my family. Okay. 
But outside of that, like I have no interest besides poker. Like there's nothing else that I pursue. Sure. So when you say like I have to like, like be honest, like, like I'm trying to. Think of it in this regard. If you were working at McDonald's, earning thirteen fifty an hour, and it was just enough to get by every single month, would you just accept that? I would like to think I wouldn't, but right. If that was like what's getting me by, I think I would just continue to do it. Right, but what doesn't make sense, where the big disconnect is, is why you continue to facilitate the cycle rather than trying to find a way to eject yourself out of it. Because I don't know how. Right. But like, you know, as is, I can sit here and I can pick apart your game all day long, but what the fuck's the difference? So how would you suggest that I start, like? It's one of those really tough pills to swallow when it's like he's been playing over 10 years at this point. Oscar didn't go to college. He pretty much poured all his belief in that he can make it in poker and through his means, right? And unfortunately, like life kind of kind of kicks you down, right? And it's like all the times that I was telling him like, hey, like you probably should be studying, you probably should be studying. He's still playing in an environment that he still sees a lot of mistakes being made. So he doesn't see the, the necessity to be studying when he's just like, I'm still better than these people. But as days go on and on, years continue to fly by, like that skill set and that barrier to maintain your profitability continues to go up and up and up. And that's like where we're at now, 10 years later, he's like, why did I, why did I pour myself into this? But yeah. the truth, the actual truth is that he really didn't pour himself into it because if he did, then he would have been studying all this time. Covered and decent. We're gonna uh, he's going to move all in. And I think yeah. Brent said call. Oh, Mallard. There's a pair. Take care. Good luck, gentlemen. <laughs> I mean, it's a check. That's my favorite hand. Can't beat it. It's my favorite hand. You don't want to beat it. No, I don't want to beat it. I can't beat it. If I do, <laughs> I have to change my favorite hand. Yeah. When Black Friday hit in 2011, that put me in a spot where I had to transition from playing so much online where I made the bulk of my money to just playing live all the time and I, I didn't have it in me. I, I didn't want to play every day. It, that's when I knew that, okay, the, the ride's over, but I love this industry, I love this game. Now what? At the very beginning it was difficult because I hadn't had a job my entire life. So I, I worked, you know, in college at a golf course. My studies in college were communications, so there's a very vast amount of positions I could have looked for. But really, I just wanted to do something that, you know, left me some flexibility so I could still play poker. But it was it was challenging because I didn't know where to start. There's very few people in poker who have never had that thought of, well, maybe I'd be better off if I did this instead. Especially if you're at a stakes and a situation where you think that your winnings are somewhat capped, that's when you have to really look at like, okay, am I better off just getting a job? I think I still have a passion for poker as a game. Um, my uh, passion for it as a living probably dwindled in 2000, mid 2010. April 2011, I went to Florida and I final tabled a tournament for a little over $240,000. Two months later is when I won the bracelet for a little over 870,000 and I got a good amount of that. Most people would be like, oh, awesome. I'm gonna continue playing poker now. I was like, awesome, I can leave poker now. I think poker has a way of kind of stripping you from your normal life mindset, especially if you're having some sort of success. If you like go broke and hit rock bottom and literally have to quit, it's almost kind of better. Whereas if you are playing and winning consistently and are just walking away because you see that it's not fulfilling, it's so hard to do that because you have to kind of take 10 steps back if you go on a different career. I never really actively 
looked for jobs, but I had just an opportunity where I got seated next to a guy in a tournament and he showed me this project he was working on and we exchanged numbers right then and there. It turns out his name was Kerry Katz and he started Poker Central and I got very lucky that I stayed in contact with him and eventually found myself a full-time career. I got lucky. I got lucky in life. I did well in school. I went to good schools. I had options. So it's really easy for me to say I saw the writing on the wall, but I think other people that have held to this dream for a long time, it's hard to give that up when you've committed so much of your life to it, when you don't really have necessarily much better options to fall back on. If you're talking about people who have been making, you know, 100,000 plus a year for a long time, then yes, I think those people could easily also be doing that in some other field. If you're talking about someone who's just barely making a living playing low stakes, I don't think it's a given that they just have other great options that, oh, you'd be better off doing this because you'd be making more money. I don't think that's always true. A very common phenomenon um, and something that all humans experience that we study in psychology is called the sunk cost fallacy. And that's this error in decision making where you look at all of the costs you've already sunk into something. Now the costs can be financial, they can also be emotional, they can be just time and effort and energy. So rather than say, okay, that's all in the past and I can't actually change the past, people say, well, I've already spent so much time on this, I've already spent so much money on this or whatever it is. So they put good money after bad, good time after bad because we don't want to just toss it. We don't want to write it off. Whereas the most rational thing for them to do is to write it off because you can't change the past, but you can change the present and you can change the future. And we're online. So now basically once I go online, I don't go off till later tonight. So I don't take any breaks. I don't take a lunch. I just truck through it and just try to knock the day off as quick as possible. I normally try to Uber to our range between like $150. Uh, so depending on how long that takes is how long my day is going to be. I'll show you something. 4.93. I've had 95% of five-star ratings, 4% of four-star ratings, and I had this one person, one fucking person, give me a one-star. And it had to be when I had my other car. That's the only way I can possibly get a one-star. So when I went out to Vegas, it was just like, all right, well, like, I want you guys to make me rich. That was my plan to go out there, you know? Like, I'm going to film this documentary, I'm going to go out there, and I'm just going to, like, something's going to click, and I'm just going to become rich. And when I went over there, I figured out that I'm not as good as I thought I was and that I have bigger problems besides poker that I have to get fixed if I want to pursue poker in the future as a profession. So I did learn stuff from the academy, but the biggest thing that I feel like I took away was like basically get your shit together outside of poker. Uh, well, it took me a little bit to really like get in like a, a concrete schedule for the most part, because again, like I was having trouble with uh, you know, finding a car, and then once I got the car, I was driving with dealership plates, so I wasn't uh, too thrilled about that in case, like, some sort of accident were to happen. Then my plates expired for, like, four days, so I couldn't really drive that. Uh, so basically, what I'm going to attempt or try to do is I'm going to Uber from uh, Monday through Friday and uh, take a trip to the casino once a week to try to play a cash session and uh, try to fire some tournaments online on Sunday because WSOP merged with three states. So uh... It makes me feel like a better person. Like, I don't know, I, I feel like when I just play poker 24 seven, I'm just like grinding and gambling and it's, like, I don't know, I just. Like, I didn't find the joy in the game. Cause like, I had to play to win. And I guess that's why like, I haven't been putting the time that I should have put into the game, just because like, 
I don't know, I just wasn't happy with myself and happy with the game and happy with where the game has taken me in the last 10 years. It's hard to explain to Christian that like, listen dude, I'm kind of happy that I'm like driving Uber. And it's like, well, what do you mean you're happy? It's difficult because it's like, well, no, I'm not happy, but like I'm happy that I don't have the stress that I was feeling before. Like I would just be in a nasty mood all the time. And it was because of the money. Like, I'm always worried about money. And that's like, you know, you're not gonna succeed in this game if you're worried about money all the time. In five years, is Oscar playing poker professionally? I don't know. He has the ability to play poker professionally if he wanted to, because he has the resources to do so. There's a lot of people that don't, they don't have the network, they don't have the funds or anything, right? Oscar has the ability to find funds if he can showcase that he can win at a level that will entice us to take on the risk. My biggest concern now is just the level of balance. Like, can he still drive Uber and sustain himself while still playing poker? I feel like I'm the best player on the table and that might be cocky or arrogant or whatever the case may be, but I always feel like comfortable at a poker table. I never feel uncomfortable, but I'm also playing bullshit stakes. It's kind of like I was telling Christian the other day, it's like, it's like, dude, I'm not you. You're a professional poker player. This is what you do for a living. Like you have an academy, you're with poker players, you're going to play the series. Like, I wish I can just be in Vegas. I wish like I didn't have like all these obligations that I have in New Jersey and I can just like uplift myself and move over there and just focus purely on poker. Like that's not my life. Because the game took a lot from me. Like I've sacrificed a lot in terms of relationships, in terms of living like a normal life. I've taken what you can say an extended break from poker. I would work basically uh, throughout the month and then towards the end of the month would try to take any money that I could, you know, be okay with losing if need be at the casino. And uh, I did it a couple times where I went to the casino, ran like one bullet up to like maybe two or three and then kind of like deviated from the plan, which was like, okay, well, you should only be playing like maybe on the weekends and just drive, you know, Monday to Thursday or Sunday to Thursday and just, you know, give yourself one day to play. But I would find myself at the casino with a $300 buy-in and then, you know, cash out 700 and find it difficult to like drive the next day for like a fraction of what I just made the night before. So I would go back to the casino and play and then maybe break even and then go back the next day and end up losing. And then before I knew it, like the week's gone, I haven't put any time driving and I just busted the bankroll. I kind of got mad at myself, to be honest, for like allowing it to happen. I wanted to just keep pressing it to see like if I can just like run it up and not have to drive no more. I guess that's why like I kept going back when I told myself like not to just uh, be disciplined. But it didn't work out and I just found myself just, all right, well, I got to go back to driving. Yeah, I mean, my life's more boring because, like, I don't have the excitement of, like, like, I'm just, just driving a lot, you know? It's, it's just boring. It, it doesn't stimulate me too much, but because I've spent my adult life pursuing poker and it hasn't worked out, I don't have much of a choice, you know? You just got to suck it up and do what you have to do. Like, if I wanted to play poker, I couldn't, you know? Like, I'll go and bust a bullet that I had de designated for poker. And then like, I'm done. Like I can't 
take more money than I'm using for bills and just like take another shot with it. And to be honest, like to be fair, I I did do that some months. Like I would take money that I couldn't lose and lost it. And then be in a position where I have to borrow money from people that I don't want to borrow money from. Uh, for instance, I borrowed money from my sister because like I really fucked up one month and uh, took a shot with money that I didn't have and lost it. And I felt like shit doing that. The last time I played was in December. I remember the hand too. I had pocket kings. I got three bet by the big blind. I flat it and the flop came out five, three, nine, two spades. He C bet pot. I went all in with kings and he called and he had five, three also. I was just like at a loss for words. I was like, wow, Did I just fucking come here and get kings cracked by some idiot in the big blind who decided to spaz out with 5-3. Like, I'm like sick to my stomach. Cause like, I just lost like the money that I've been saving to play with. And I pick up pocket kings and just get cracked by some dummy. And like a professional player can just be okay with that. It's like, oh, okay, well it happens. Good, I want you to three bet me with 5-3. I'll catch you later. But for me, it wasn't, it's, it's, it's not like that. It's like, fuck man. Like, did I just really get three bet by this guy with five three off and just flops fucking two pair on this, like, a board where I'm supposed to be good here, like, all the times? Like, how come he doesn't have tens or queens or jacks? Like, he has five three off and just flops two pair. And now I'm stacked. And I feel like a dick. Because I just drove all the way here. I didn't even play two hours. And I'm about to drive all the way back. And I just lost my poker bankroll. So like after that happens, it kind of makes it difficult for me to come home and like want to study. Let me see what I could have done different in that hand. Maybe I should have four bet. Maybe I shouldn't have went all in. Maybe I should have just called and then he jams the turn. I'm supposed to just call again and lose like that. But it's just like after that happens, I come home. I'm like, fuck, get in my car, start driving and make some money. And then it's like, do I really want to. It makes it hard to want to do it again, you know, because I know the feeling that I get. Once I'm all the way in Philadelphia and now I'm driving home fucking broke. I don't know. It just doesn't, it just sucks. And there's the Kasuf trademarked repeat. It's one of these coolers again, really, back to back. If you got it, you got it, right? A big hand here, I don't think I can pass. I can't call, it's either all in or pass. What do you want me to do? You want me to go all in or fold? Talk to me. You don't say anything, I might have to ship it here. You want to gamble? Play for the win, right? Or are you going to wait for the next page jump at 15? Clock. I think I might have to. You're just an abusive person, man. It's not, it's not funny. It's not, it's not a abusive? game. Why, why you're, you're, you're being abusive to me. How am I being abusive? You're being abusive. It's called verbal abuse. Why what you're it? doing to me what? is verbal abuse. You're not even gaining any what? information. He's what not you're talking doing to you. is so verbal just... abuse. Why you're a bully. Abuse? It's rude. It's mean. It's called speech play. It's not about, no, it's not up. called speech play. It's called being a bad person. You should How's really check person? yourself. Why? Why check your privilege. It's called speech play. Check your privilege. I'm trying to get information. The stress level of poker, especially playing poker tournaments, is really, really tough to deal with. And when you're friends with a lot of non-poker players, it's very hard for them to understand the emotional swings of poker. And you're just so far removed from what they're dealing with on a daily basis. That was one reason why I wanted to get out of poker because in poker, it's like you, you flip for bills, you do credit card roulette, like it's just everything is a gamble and it's never like, let's just split this bill. You know, it's, you just remove yourself from society because of the disconnection to money that you have to have. You want to gamble? Okay, I'm all in. I call. Let's go. Woo! Come on, baby. Let's go. Whatever happens, he's cooler. Whatever happens. Myself, as well as other people who have found success in poker, there's a bit of sort of some obsessive personality traits, you know, associated with that. And it's, it's not free. If it happens, it happens. It's happened to me before. I'll be, I'll be fine. This feels like Will against the world. 
and the world is winning. You know, there were many times throughout my poker career where like I would finish a session and just like the emotional pain I'd be going through after was like unbearable, <laughs> you know, where I was just like, what have I done? You are the most disgusting human being in the two world. Threes? Of course. Wow. Wow. Pick one. Kidding. Joke. You better win this tournament. <laughs> You just need to adjust to losing because in poker, especially tournament poker, you're going to lose a lot more often than you're going to win. It's just, just the nature of, of tournaments. You know, you're not going to cash everything you play. You're not going to win everything you play. You can work as hard as everyone else in the room, but at the end of the day, if you're not playing the right games, if you're not playing the right stakes, if you're not doing the things that are important on the outside of poker, I think that you can have break-even years. I think you can have losing years by being an excellent player. And you have to have the mental stability to kind of fight through that. Why do I have to choose this for a living? I gotta be the sickest person in the whole entire universe. But a lot of people do get frustrated because they think they are running bad or they think they deserve the win because they haven't won in a long time. I wouldn't say that anyone deserves to win at poker. You think he has the puke in his mouth right now, or he's already swallowed it back down? I think if he were like most people, it would still be in his mouth, but I think Eric Seidel <laughs> was so controlled, never really shows any emotion. Or anything to get to him. The best people in the world, they're almost robotic. You know, they just never take breaks, they never get emotional, they never get tilted. And you kind of obviously have to be that way. Um, but I don't really know if I ever fully want to be that way. <laughs> it's hard to kind of retain your sanity when things really aren't going your way in this game. Why? What can you do? You played it fine. I don't know why. <laughs> I believe sort of that I'm built for this kind of life and I think it's like, it's tough to endure gambling swings. You know, I've been doing that since I was like a kid and it was very romanticized to me like it was I wanted to hang out. I just wanted to hang out. And Matt has come back in the room to say his goodbyes. Now, what a gesture here from Matt Affleck in the wake of that brutal bust out. He felt he did not leave the stage in the proper manner, so he comes back and does the right thing. I would say that poker taught me in many ways to be emotionally stable, but it didn't come super easy because I had to first experience the fluctuations in my emotional state from winning and losing and learn how to reconcile that over time. AJ sends a very strong player, and Andrew Lucky Chewy Lichtenberger to the rail in 221st place. When you're playing some sort of huge high stakes cash game, if you run some huge bluff and it goes poorly, I mean, that could be months, years, whatever of your income. And so if you don't really believe in yourself and really believe you're gonna be able to execute and make the best choices, uh, you know, you're at a significant disadvantage compared to the guy who does. Puke. When I get beaten down a little bit by the game or by the volatility or the variance, it spills over. You know, before, I just thought, well, when shit goes wrong, it's really easy to just get life right, regain control, and then deviate back into trying to play good poker. But what I'm really fundamentally understanding is that when shit goes wrong, my head, no matter how much I want to convince myself that I'm completely locked in, and maybe even feel like I am in the moment because I'm trying so fucking hard to be, it's actually not. It's deteriorated to a point where it's like the smallest little thing is going to trigger me. And I'm just going to have this flux of emotional response. And that's why I'm saying, like, it's okay to take a break. It's always okay to just, like, acknowledge to yourself, like, this isn't working right now. If I keep trying to press, I'm going to fail. And if I fail, then what? Heading to a local game. Actually, it's not even too far from where I live. Uh, it's about a mile away. Uh, I haven't played cash. And uh, I want to say maybe a month or two, but uh, yeah, it should be fun. Let's see how it goes. I used to live on 78th, and there was a game on 79th Street in a garage. And I only went to that game because it was closer than the other game that I was supposed to go to. So I was like, ah, oh, this one's closer. 
And then we got robbed uh, by four dudes at gunpoint. Kind of why I don't really like to go to these games anymore, but this one shouldn't be anything like that one. That one was like less, there was like no security. Was, it was like pretty weak game. It was my fault for even deciding to play in there. But I had never had a problem at a poker game, so. So there's a difference between precision and psychology. And they don't actually overlap in our poker. The psychology is almost always gonna be fundamentally rooted in where we're at in our life. And that's really what reactions are, is how am I feeling right now in this moment? I'm scared, so I run. How am I feeling right now in this moment? I'm threatened, so I fight. And we put ourselves, unfortunately, into a very hostile environment. So we're more prone to experiencing this stuff than others. If we prepare for it before it happens, we we're able to cut it off at the head. What's up, man? How you doing, Oscar? Nice to meet you, bro. Right, you let yeah, you know. yeah, so like I don't know if you're aware, but so we're filming like a documentary, yeah. and basically uh, anybody that doesn't Wanna like be in just yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. shoot around them and we'll blur their face at the end. Uh, That's yeah, cool. Yeah. I'm gonna talk to everybody once everybody gets here. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then we'll see who doesn't want to be in. Yeah, yeah, I feel, you, I feel. You. I'm like a legit smoking room. Yeah. <laughs> no joke. What's up, fellas? What's up, man? Oscar, nice to meet you. Man. Look at this motherfucker. What's up, bro? How you been? Good. Sharks over here. The body is meant to be stressed. It's meant to be under stress. It's meant to engage fight or flight, but it's meant to have it happen in small doses that we can actually handle. We're dealing with it at long durations, and what's happening is that system's never getting shut off. So we have this constant cortisol drip where the stress hormone is in release over and over and over like an IV, and we're constantly flowing back and forth between an emotional response and cognitive thought, and they're kind of melting together. That's why I preach to you guys, go after somebody. Because the second you can engage in emotional response, they're done. There's nothing they can do to curb that. There are fucking challenges and pitfalls laid all across the path for you. So, you know, just prep yourself for it. That's, that's the best thing I can advise. Anybody have anything? Perfect. Do we need anything else? Ketchup. Ketchup? Forget it. We're good. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. So this is the game that I'm going to tonight. They have a progressive high hand. Which is crazy because I hit a straight flush yesterday and if I hit it at this place, I would've got a thousand dollars for it. I hit it at the club and I got nothing. <laughs> so I just started to go back to the warehouse that we played at and going to that game led me to another game, led me to another game, led me to another game. And now I'm playing five days a week. I've been beating them up pretty much since I started going there and they're just like confused to how like I can win at an 80% rate. I've had like four or five people ask me for them to back me. They want coaching. They said they're willing to pay me for coaching. I told them 100 an hour. They're like, yeah. Christian tells me that underground games are unbeatable because you can't beat the rake in the long run, no matter how good you are. The house is always gonna win and like, like you just can't outrun the rake, especially if you're there playing the whole night. But I don't know, man. It's, I feel like 2004 or something. Like they're they're just like, like oblivious to uh, some of the stuff which I consider is just common sense. I'm just solid at the table. Like I'm like a machine. Like, and that's kind of could be a negative. 
But I'm just like so focused at the table. Like I always wear a hoodie. You know, people wear sunglasses, they have car protectors. I'm always like in my hoodie with my headphones and I don't I don't talk you're, to anyone. You're all, you're all they really look at me, they're like, dude, you look like a ninja. That's what they call me. Like it's weird, but it, it's all good at the same time. I mean, he's in a good spot now. I mean, it worked out. It was weird. He didn't want to play the underground games, right? When we said, like, yo, we'll give you a stake for the underground games, whatever. And he gets in the underground game, but then, like, gets offered shit. So, like, opportunity kind of stacked up, and now he feels, like, much better. But Well, he feels better because he has money. Because he's emotionally stable. He's financially stable. He's in a good headspace where he actually could absorb a lot. There has to be a big sense of relief that just comes with a year and a half of struggle and then suddenly being able to look and say like my bills are paid for the next few months. I completely agree. I just think these games are just going to fall apart in a year and I don't know what happens then. But I don't think... He Do you think we're doing him a disservice by facilitating that dream? By making it seem like if he puts in enough time, effort and focus that that is a sustainable future? Mm. My guess for the dream is that if you're at the low stakes, you're probably stuck. I don't know that there's a lot of one-two players that are ever going to be playing at Aria in Bobby's room. I don't know that there are a lot of one-two players that are ever going to be you know, buying into 10K tournaments on the circuit. And that's okay. I think that a lot of those guys can play one-two and manage to make a, a, a decent living. In the last four years, I've learned for sure that I enjoy the game more when I'm not relying on it. It's like night and day for me if I'm playing for rent money versus I'm playing for enjoyment. I don't play high stakes, I play low stakes still, and when I have a job and I, and I play a couple times a week, I enjoy it so much more. I mean, I would have to say that poker's helped me immeasurably. Like, I've met the vast majority of my close friends through poker. It's given me a lot of opportunity in terms of traveling and just having financial freedom. I know I owe a lot to poker, like I, I can't see how it's been anything but a huge net positive for me. You know, I'm as passionate as I ever have been about my personal love and interest in the game. With that said, I don't often like sharing that publicly again because I feel like every time I say something like that, it lights a fire under a, a number of people that really should not have that fire lit under them. and would just be much better off choosing another career path. Most of the people that I play poker with love the game, are fascinated by the game, and I still feel that. I feel like I'm so curious about how hands are played and what people are doing, and it's just, uh, it's, it's really interesting to go to work. I think that it's important to love your life. I don't think that that necessarily means loving what you do for every single person. I think it means understanding why you do every single thing that you do. I think too many of us go through life not questioning our choices, feeling stuck in certain situations, feeling stuck with certain decisions, and being driven more by inertia than by anything else. So I think that everyone needs to do this every few years to sit down and question yourself and question your choices and actually think, is this making me happy? Am I doing these things because I want to or because this is what I've always done? And I think that poker is one of these things that you should not do it unless you love it. So some jobs pay the bills. Poker is not a nice job. It's something that's really difficult. And then the more you learn, the harder the game becomes. So I don't think that you are going to get better at poker if you hate what you do. And you have to remember that you're playing a game. If it's not a game to you, if it's not fun, if it's not enjoyable, then why the hell are you doing it?